calling it mini Milton, so don't call it a Milton at all, please. No time, this is not a Milton. That way we have all the objectives, the squats, and all the other fancy crap. Because it's an experiment, there's a good chance that it's going to be a big, gigantic clusterfuck. Hello and welcome to the Dark Ray Project. Today we want to talk about the making of the Mini School Game 2015, hosted by LT. LT is a well-known airsoft host in Canada, Ontario. One of his specialities is to gain access to empty schools for games. Now, one day LT asked if anyone is interested to once design a game for one of those school games. And we follow this call since we are very curious how our almost 25 years of combined computer game development translate into designing for airsoft. Now, a quick premise of what we were kind of given by LT was the location going to be an elementary school. The game is supposed to be a bit milton like um, There's going to be a break in between, so we're talking about two rounds each about two to three hours. Now, in the computer game industry, we normally build our own environments for our games. If you design it for Airsoft, the environment is kind of given. And you can only do some minor modification in terms of moving, let's say, cover around and whatnot. So, as you see here, this is a relatively um, basic school layout, which comes with a couple of problems. But we're not going to whine around a lot. We can also title down the solution, which we have in plan. So, first of all, what currently grays out is out of play because it's the staging ground, this is the gym area. The defining factor for every school is hallways. And in that case, because it's a relatively small Catholic um, elementary school, there are two big linear hallways, which is the primary defining layout aspect, which is also a big, big limiting factor because you don't see any big flanking routes here. So the first thing we wanted to tackle down is to get a little bit away from the typical setup of cover in these hallways, because if you do it in a zigzag fashion, you only have one lane. In order to tackle this down, we thought about opening up the whole setup um, with a higher density of cover and to creating two lanes because two lanes means more options and more options traditionally means more fun. The other traditional problem which we wanted to look into is the position of the CPs where players respawn. So the principal idea is that you run out of your CP, you have a faster momentum in the hallway and you normally slow down a little bit at the stairs which very quickly results into uh, fights around stairways, which are not very fun to begin with. And because it is easier to fight from the top down to the bottom, many games then end up around CP camping, which isn't great either, which is also a common problem which we're going to tackle down later. Just the CP camping itself. The first solution for our problem is to place the CPs both on the top floor, so we don't have much of the stairway fighting. That also means that all our objectives are going to be at the bottom floor and it's going to be our main fighting ground. So if the two teams now run out of the CP, ideally they fight primarily in the center of the bottom floor around all the objectives with a little bit of favor of the team number two because they have the more complex objectives in those rooms. Now the center stairway, we plan to have it blocked by default for both teams and use it as a balancing element or balancing tool. So for example, in, in what you see now on the screen is team number two got an advantage downstairs, they pushed up team number one quite a lot of the bottom floor. Then we're opening up the center staircase for team number one, which then allows them to flank team number two around the center. If now team number one got the upper hand, we're closing the staircase and vice versa for the other team in case of balancing is required again. All right, what other balancing factors do we have? So if two teams normally fight, the obvious choice as a balancing factor is to add a third faction. So we're planning to use civilians in small quantities, that's the reason why it's a small little green dude, um, just about two guys, and hopefully they can help in order to, to, to work on the balance as well. The next aspect in order to, it's not necessarily a balancing thing, it's more of a resetting element, is mortaring. So we basically say if there's a big stalemate at the bottom floor, we can say, you know what, everybody is dead at the bottom floor, it allows both teams to reset. That gives especially the, the team who has to progress right now or got pushed back a lot um, in order to go out and then try it once again. The third one is to tackle down the CP camping problem. And it's not necessarily the, the perfect solution for it, but by saying right from the get-go, everybody in the CP is invincible, it ideally should reduce the motivation for the enemy team to camp and to shoot into a CP because it makes no point at all. It just pushes back the problem a little bit away from the CP 
allowing the team potentially to make a big push out. And the last one is because we have a lot of players, around 60 in this relatively small school, is to only allow a limited number of active players on the field per team in order to reduce the amount of cramping up in the hallways. This is simply a result of the amount of space we have available compared to the number of uh, players who are planning to come. Alright, because this whole thing is supposed to be a bit milsim like we decided to go for a very typical squat-based medic rule system. So there's one medic in a squat, they can be healed all over the place, it's the usual bleeding out time, a little bit shorter because we are faster paced in smaller space. And also very important, if the medic runs out of bandages, the entire squat is dead to make sure that the squat stays together. Um, you would be surprised if people get even lost in smaller schools. The second type of Milsim character thing, seriously, it's not a really Milsim, it's rather Milsim light or Milsim inspired, is to have asymmetrical objectives. So both teams don't have the same objective, like both teams don't go for flipping flags, which might be considered by some people a bit more arcadey. And the third one is, it's not necessarily a Milsim thing, but I wanted to have uh, high pressure on command and on the player a fast pace in order to, to stress them out a little bit simply to, to create a little bit of this whole chaos feeling and then try to straggle this down and in order also to give command a lot to do in a short amount of time to get the best out of the two to three hours per round. Now let's look at the objectives. I'm planning to use about five objectives. In order to lay them out in a good way I created this very very brief pacing graph in order to, to get a good variety. So we're starting with a slow paced start. One team trying to get wide space control while they have to memorize certain codes and the enemy team tries to capture them. I like a slow start because this is a good entry to make sure that this Milsim is not just all about big skirmish again. The next objective, we're increasing the intensity. Now it's all about a point domination with a VIP while the enemy team tries to assassinate him. Thirdly, let's get the stress up. It's all about team coordination and speed, which is often the hardest thing to, to get done, especially for command to coordinate everything with the squad leaders and everything else, um, and potentially limited number of people out there. So this is going to be very, very high stress. Then it is time after all those high stresses to slow things down again, give them a bit more time, give them something else to do. It's, again, a bit more brain power. They have to solve puzzles or math things on the field um, while the enemy team tries to disrupt them. And the last objective is sort of the finale of the whole thing. It's full force, high stakes, all out point domination, to, just to get the pacing really, really up for the highlight of the game. Now, because all that is, is nice and good, but it's still very traditional, it's very classical. So I wanted to have a couple of flavor elements, which hopefully um, work well for the game. So first of all, um, I talked to civilians and they're trying to role play a little bit. It's always a little bit of an extra flavor element here. There. Because we have civilians out there and I try to add a little bit of role playing and a slow start, um, my idea is that to allow the people to dress up as civilians, which might create a little bit of chaos, cool stories, and all kind of those kind of things. The third thing is because we're in a school, so let's use it to our advantage, we have light switches. We can change the light conditions depending on the game objective, use it for balancing, so we see what we can do about that. And the fourth thing is loadout changes. So, for example, I'm planning to, the beginning slow paced, one team is only allowed to use pistols, but they have higher numbers compared to the other guys with rifles, but lower numbers. Just a little bit of flavor to, to add the whole civilian factor to it, the infiltration, reconnaissance, and all these kind of things. So I'm really hoping this is all gonna work out just fine. All right, up in the CPs. All right. Let's first quickly go through the day before we look at what exactly went well and what went bad and what to do better next time. We started early to set up the hallways, cover with some great guys as main support. The new cover rules were quickly understood and executed. The school had a ton of cover objects available even though we had to carry them out a lot. Then came lots of briefings of players, game control, command and so on until we could finally start round number one. I was at the American CP since they started with the more complex objectives while LT covered the Russians. We also had the civilians downstairs and game control all over the building. During objective number one, the Americans managed to get two of the three required codes till they were interrupted by the Russians capturing three of their operators while triggering already the next objective. The bad luck remained on the American side for the next two objectives, but they finally won the last two. Then we switched CP and objectives for the second round after an hour break. This time I stayed with the Russian command. They managed to rush incredibly fast with the first two objectives, way faster than anyone expected. Then the Americans started to control most of the field, including the top floor, locking down the movement of the Russians. 
However, the last objective they made several strong pushes and managed to achieve a last victory. At that point Russia had four objectives, one while the Americans only had two. However, later on during um, the after action report it became clear that it was rather a draw. Fair enough, and more about that in a few minutes. Oh, I have a broom! Don't touch me! Why you touch me? Why you touch me? Why you make my life? Sir, sir. If you make my bread for lunch, I have to... Why you do that? 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 What's wrong with you? Is my broom? Is my life free hood? Why you do that? Why you do that? Why you do that to me? Why you come to my life? Why you break everything? Why you make the mess? What is wrong with you? Why? Why are you so evil? Die, die, you dead, you dead! Why you do that? You dead, you got my Ah! Why you shoot me? Why? I'm bleeding! Now let's talk about what went well so far. Civilians as role players was much appreciated by the players. Civilians also work great as a balancing tool and NPCs as part of objectives is always a nice flavor element. Restricting the center stairway and only opening it up as a balancing element worked, even though of course it isn't good that we had to have such an element um, at the first place. CP and objective locations worked well, but there were initial confusion and the original map wasn't as accurate as we hoped for. All the light darkness changes, loaders restriction, invincible guys and CPs and all the other small little flavor stuff I talked about before um, worked out exactly as we intended. The mid-game discussion about potential design changes was reassuring since it showed that the present players themselves fundamentally believed in the design and according to them it was more a matter of executing them correctly. I can try put it. No, no, okay, okay. comfortable with the answer? Because the system might be, you know, okay, okay, let's see if we can move ahead here. Four. Oh, what didn't went well? We had severe radio transmission issues throughout the building among game control, which obviously made miscommunication more likely. Using the fire alarm map as a base was a great idea, however, it had too many inaccuracy and especially one in particular. The room next to the center staircase on the top floor had a movable separating wall which opened up the main floor, but first was separated by us with a red line which players weren't allowed to cross. That, run, that red line was removed mid-game and not probably communicated to all players. All those discoveries and on-the-fly changes caused bad misunderstanding and confusion among the players. Even the whole execution of the red line in front of the center stairway wasn't as clear as we hoped for. Restricting the number of active players and further restricting some of them to the top floor worked to prevent overcrowding the small space, but caused some bad misunderstandings as well for some players. Now finally the whole bandage, medic, bleeding, squad rules or whatever. We thought using pretty much existing rules from popular milsims and just adjust them, the numbers plus allow the medic to be healed by non-medics for a higher cost would be pretty much straightforward. And yes, for most players it was clear and well executed, but not for all. Still, we won't point out to those players for being too stupid to read. At the end, it's always the designer's fault for not being clear enough for everyone. The same goes for the player's restrictions, some objective text, and so on. There was some unhappiness about the mortar strike at the end, the second round. So far we could find out afterwards it was a perfect fine call by the game control on the ground to get rid of the stalemate and ultimately I take full responsibility for it and step to the call. A stagnated game isn't helping anyone who wants to enjoy the game in a fair way. There was a dispute about the final objective where game control allowed individual squad members to stay in the fight even if the rules stated that the squad respawned as a complete unit. This call was made on site in order to continue a good firefight. I wasn't there, but ultimately I have to trust the game control on site to make the right calls, even if that means some bad blood in the after action report. Leave. We have decided we don't want you anymore. Go, go, go. Go that way. Go now. You, you, you. Go now. I'm here, yeah. Go. I'm here, yeah. Huh? Hello. I'm here, yeah. Yeah, go, go. It's our line. Go. Go away. Go away. It's our line. It's my soil. Okay. You go, you go back to where you came from. That way. Go. Why, why that way? No, no, go. go. I'm just making sure you don't pull it up. Okay, I do. 
Campbell, no, no. Campbell, Campbell, you're dead. <laughs> what should we do better next time? Relying on players to have read the game rules was the first rookie mistake and won't happen again. So we're going to take the time to read out the rules loud at the game start again and to answer questions. Especially the whole medic bleeding squad rules could have been clarified for everyone. Better casing on the location and better map to foresee such problem with the room next to the blocked staircase which suddenly turned out to be open. Way clearer documentation in a more graphical documenting style so players in command have to read less and important aspects are highlighted for better understanding. Last but not least, better clarification among game control in terms of mortars and on the spot rule interpretation. Maybe we don't kill them right now. You're a dead man. <sighs> what did he give you? Like a boost job. <laughs> cool. At the end, we want to believe it went better than expected. We try to find as many loopholes and game breaking events beforehand, and we had working solutions for them in place. Unfortunately, we had to have too many of such systems in place, given the location which made the game more rule loaded as needed, despite several pre previous design plans of simplifications. Still, on the big picture, we want to believe that the game was a success. At that point, we have to thank LT for hosting the game and giving us the opportunity to design it. All the civilian game controls for the help, both commanders and of course all the players who helped to not turn this whole thing in a big clusterfuck. We from the Dark Ray Project learned a lot, and you can bet that next time will be a lot better. Have a good one. Go, go where you came from. Get lost. Go, go American scum. Go, go American scum. Listen, bud. What, 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 what you gonna do, you huh? You won't be threatening me. Yo, look at my big gun. gun. Yo, whoa, bro, bro. Ah, ah. Grenade! What the hell? <laughs>